where you see the passing of time. Three crowds in St. Peter's Square are praying like mad for the Pope's life. Where moments refuse to die. This is a momentous hour in world history. This is the invasion of Hitler's Europe. And where victory lives on. Plenty of girls are being kissed by plenty of boys they don't know, and they do not care. You can love it, hate it, embrace it, or turn away. Lennon was shot to death late last night outside his apartment building. But it is a past we all share. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big Davy salute. This is where yesterday has a home, where we wonder what it was like back then. Go forward, knights in safety. And not too long ago. His spirit must live on. It's where history has its place and where the past comes alive. The History Channel. A young woman cries rape. I held her and she continued crying and she told me that she had been raped. She pointed to him and said, that's the person. The accused is sent to prison. Years pass. Then the accuser announces there was no rape. I want to see that man out. He's innocent. I just want to thank her for showing that uh, some people's conscience do, do bother them about things they have done in the past. But the law is wary of witnesses who change their story years after a trial. That man's life was hanging on the line yesterday, and justice failed him. I would stake my life on the fact that she was not raped by Gary Dodson. Around 10.30 p.m. on the night of July 9th, 1977, Policewoman Anna Carroll was patrolling the small town of Homewood, south of Chicago, when a call came over her radio. She was told to meet two fellow officers back at the station. When she arrived, her colleagues were leading a teenager down the hallway. It was obvious that something bad had happened to this little girl. Crying hysterically and clutching her torn blouse to her chest, 16-year-old Kathy Crowell told Officer Carroll that she had been raped. When Kathy calmed down, she told me that on her way home from working at the Long John Silver's restaurant, she was walking through the parking lot and she saw a car traveling in a goofy way, kind of driving around a, a lamppost. The teenager claimed that the car sped towards her, trying to run her down, that she dove out of its path, crashing into some garbage cans, and then heard a passenger in the car yell, two points. She said the next thing she knew, two young men grabbed her. She struggled as they dragged her into the car, cracking her head on the doorframe. She remembered that one of the men had long, greasy, blonde hair. For the next two hours, she said, the man held her down in the back seat and raped her, while the two others drank beer and snorted cocaine. Then she claimed the blonde man scratched her stomach with a piece of glass, possibly from a broken beer bottle. Finally, they let her go. A policeman discovered her sobbing and wandering in this park, a mile from where she said she had been abducted. At the hospital, a physical exam corroborated Kathy's story. The doctor found a large semen stain in her underpants, a golf ball-sized lump on her head, internal vaginal bruises, external bruising on her breasts, and scratches on her abdomen. The police thought they looked like letters. They were fairly deep scratches, not bleeding from what I remember, but deep enough where it looked as though someone wrote on her stomach area. Officer Carroll made this sketch of the marks, 
But authorities could not make out any words. It seemed to be gibberish. The next day, the officer questioned Kathy again, along with her foster mother at their home. The teenager was still visibly upset from her ordeal. She provided more crucial details. She described the clothing that was worn by the offender and his hair and, and the car that, that they were in and the other two people in the car. I recall asking her mother about that. Does she always remember things so well? And she said that that was very much like her, that she, she didn't miss anything. Detective Jerry Brandt was assigned to the case. An artist drew a sketch of the alleged attacker. Based on the drawing, police gave Kathy hundreds of mug shots to study. She was leafing through the photos, and she stopped at one picture and said, that's the guy. Kathy had picked out 19-year-old Gary Dotson. Dotson lived in a neighboring suburb, Country Club Hills. His police record included convictions for petty theft and shoplifting, but nothing as serious as rape. The detective tracked Dotson down at his landscaping job and brought him into the station for questioning. Dotson claimed he was miles away when the rape occurred and that his friend, Mickey Markham, would back up his alibi. Markham said that he, Gary, and their friends were on the other side of town at the time Kathy was abducted. They had attended two parties that night and stayed out until early the next morning. The detective put both men into a lineup and called Kathy to the station. She looked through the two-way mirror for only a few seconds. There was no hesitation whatsoever. She, she pointed to him and said, that's the person. After identifying Dotson, she told detectives that she couldn't be sure, but she thought she recognized another man in the lineup as well. That man, she said, looked a little like the one who had been sitting in the passenger seat of the car while she was raped. Police charged Dotson with rape. Investigators tested his blood against the semen stain found in Kathy's underpants. In 1977, the crime lab was not as sophisticated as it is today. Uh, we didn't have the benefit of DNA testing at that time. These samples that we submitted all came back similar to Gary's, but not conclusive. The crime lab reported that it was Dotson's blood type in the semen, but could not be more specific. There were other loose ends. Kathy claimed that she had fought and scratched her attacker on the chest and ear. But when Gary was picked up six days later, he had no such scratches. The police were never able to produce the car where the rape allegedly took place. They had no evidence on Mickey Markham beyond Kathy's uncertain identification, and he was never charged. Whenever you cannot tie everything together, there's always some concern. But in this case, I was dealing with a victim that was positive of her identification and was more than willing to pursue it in a criminal action. After the customary legal wrangling and delays, Gary Dotson's trial began on May 24th, 1979 nearly two years after the alleged rape. Prosecutor Ray Garza was determined that Kathy's attacker be punished. Everything that she reported seemed to be corroborated. It presented a tremendous responsibility because since she was the victim of such a violent attack, you wanted to make sure that you did everything you could to uh, see that justice was done. Prosecutors ripped into Dotson's alibi, pointing out that aside from his friends, Gary had no one to substantiate his claims that he was attending parties at the time of the rape. The prosecution then put its star witness on the stand. Kathy told the jury of the savage attack with the same intricate detail that she had reported it to the police. When she was finished, the prosecutor requested that she point out the man who had raped her. Teary-eyed and without hesitation, she pointed to Gary Dotson and probably the most dramatic aspect of the trial. She couldn't have come across better. I, in fact, in all the years I've prosecuted cases, as I think back, that's one victim who, once you were done with her on the stand, you felt confident that a jury would not let justice be denied. 
It only took the jury an hour and a half to find Dotson guilty. The judge decided that the vicious nature of the attack warranted extreme punishment. He sentenced Dotson to 25 to 50 years in prison. In a rape trial, a single eyewitness, the alleged victim, can often determine the outcome with her testimony. Is she confident, sympathetic, believable? Kathy Crowell fit the bill. Rape trials have become more sophisticated in recent years as DNA evidence has made the crime easier to prove or disprove. When Crowell accused Gary Dotson, DNA testing had not yet made it into the courtroom. If only it had. Six years after the verdict, Kathy came forward with a shocking confession. Gary Dotson, she announced, was innocent. She had made the whole thing up. She felt awful about it. And she was ready to officially recant her testimony so that Gary could go free. But it was not so simple as she, Dotson, and the rest of the country were about to find out. In 1979, while Gary Dotson adjusted to life behind bars, the woman he was convicted of raping, Kathy Crowell, started a new life of her own. During the trial, she had struck up a romance with a classmate from high school named David Webb. Two years later, they married. After visiting Kathy's brother in New Hampshire, the newlyweds decided to settle there and start a family. They had a son and later a daughter. In 1983, the couple joined the Pilgrim Baptist Church and became born-again Christians. On the surface, Kathy's loving family and quiet life seemed idyllic, but she often had trouble sleeping and nightmares. We noticed that she would go through periods of depression. And one day she just called my wife Bonnie and said, I need you to come over right now. And so Bonnie went over. In March 1985, she told the pastor's wife that she could no longer keep an awful secret she had carried for eight years. Her faith demanded that she bring the secret into the light. Kathy broke into tears as she confessed that when she was 16, she had falsely accused a man of raping her. What Kathy related to us was that she had been in some sin with a young man. She was living with foster parents and was afraid that if this came out, if she got pregnant especially, that she would be tossed out. So she decided to fake a rape. The rape, she said, had never occurred. It was all an elaborate lie, a lie that had put an innocent man in prison. When Kathy came to us, her goal was to get Gary out of jail. She didn't know how to do that, neither did I, so I contacted my friend John McClario, a lawyer. McClario was not only a lawyer, but a Christian fundamentalist. The pastor wanted Kathy to have an attorney who understood her religious convictions. She wanted to trust Christ as her savior, and she realized if she did that, she would have to right all the wrongs that she did in her life and uh, this was, of course, one that was weighing very heavily on her conscience. The lawyer advised Kathy that she might face charges of perjury, that coming forward would disrupt not only her life, but her family's as well. Kathy was adamant about pressing forward. She believed she had broken the ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy brother. She was more than willing to give her life to release a person that was unjustly accused based on her testimony. On March 26, 1985, Kathy's lawyer filed an affidavit of her recantation with the Cook County Circuit Court in Chicago. Two days later, Kathy called a press conference to tell the world the same thing. Reporters gathered in her attorney's office in Milwaukee and listened as she told her news story over the phone from her home in New Hampshire. I decided that I would make up a lie that I was raped. And I had no intention of having anyone arrested. I made up a fictitious description. But through circumstances, uh, Gary Dotson was brought forward, and I accused him. I did something that was despicable, and I wish I could turn the clocks back. Kathy's public confession generated an avalanche of press attention to Gary Dotson's plight. Initially, there was no reason uh, to do anything but say, wow, what reason was there to doubt it? 
and everybody ran with it just, uh, just on, on the face value of the thing. The day after Kathy's admission, Dotson hired a lawyer and held a press conference of his own from prison. I just want to thank her for showing that uh, some people's conscience do, do bother them about the things they have done in the past. And uh, I hope everything goes well for her. Remarkably, Dotson seemed to have no anger towards the woman who had falsely accused him. I can't hold her against her because I knew people do get, um, women get shocked over these things. And I accepted it as that there, and uh, she made a mistake. Kathy Webb and Gary Dotson became instant media sensations. The next day, Kathy appeared on a national morning news program with a surprise guest, Gary's mother, Barbara. I really would like to say to Mrs. Dotson that I'm so sorry for what I did to you and your family, and to, especially to Gary and his name and his life and how I took six years away from him. And I really, I really want your forgiveness, especially Gary's forgiveness. You're forgiven, Kathy. I just want my son back, and I thank you so much for coming forward. It took a lot of courage. Any courage that I have and any bravery I have is because of my faith in God. And, and uh, without him, I wouldn't have had the courage to come forward. But as the story grew, questions emerged about Kathy's credibility and Gary Dotson's innocence. We weren't going to take her at face value. Here she was relying on uh, a newfound religion as her claim uh, for Mr. Dotson being set free. And people were very skeptical. It just didn't feel right. I've seen people get out of prison wrongfully accused before and since. This was so flat, there was, not only was there no anger, there was no real joy. I mean, he looked even a little puzzled. Kathy's recantation sparked skepticism, partly because she refused to talk about it to anyone without her pastor in the room. They kept coming up with angles. She was in a cult and under the influence of a cult leader, or she was, uh, emotionally unstable. The public, however, clamored for Dotson's release, demanding to know why the prosecutors were dragging their feet when they had an innocent man behind bars. The government just wasn't going to let her walk into court and say, I lied, everything's forgotten, now everyone go home. In fact, it's very difficult for a convict to win a new trial based on charges of perjured testimony. The courts are extremely reluctant to reverse a jury's unanimous guilty verdict. Kathy Crowell Webb's March 1985 confession that she had lied about being raped and sent the innocent Gary Dotson to prison exploded in the press before anyone in the Chicago DA's office had even heard of it. Kathy created the media circus. Uh, this thing was not handled the way uh, it should have been. No one approached the prosecutor's office no one went through the right channels to suggest they had this rape victim who was now recanting and could we sit down and talk with you. While public opinion was overwhelmingly on the side of Gary Dotson, the law is predisposed to doubt any recantation and the state was prepared to defend the original conviction. Both the judge and the jury in the Dotson case had a chance to hear the witnesses when the memories were fresh. Uh, when presumably they were being guided by what happened rather than by uh, afterthoughts or changes of heart or changes of mind. And that's why the law erects this sort of barrier to prevent an easy uh, reversal of convictions. What the law does allow is a recantation hearing to determine whether a convict deserves a new trial because of perjured testimony. Dotson's attorney, Warren Lupel, was confident that Kathy's recantation would free his client. His confidence only grew as he studied the case further. It turned out Kathy Crow Webb's testimony was not the only perjurious testimony in the trial. There was other uh, testimony presented by the state which was also equally egregiously false. During the rape trial, 
A forensic scientist who had evaluated the semen stain found in Kathy's underpants testified that the blood type matched Dotson's type O blood, a type found in 10% of the population. An independent analysis of the data showed that this conclusion was faulty. In fact, the data showed the semen could be matched with the blood of up to two-thirds of the population. Nevertheless, many people involved in the case expressed doubts when first hearing about Kathy's recantation. I was flabbergasted, but I always was sure, and I still am, that something bad happened to her that night. And yet it was hard to ignore that the story Kathy told on national television was heartfelt and believable. I first observed Kathy Crowell Webb on the Today Show in late March of 1985, talking about the fact that she had wrongly caused the conviction of an innocent man by claiming that he had raped her. And quite frankly, when I saw her on that show that morning, I thought she was very convincing. The recantation hearing began on April 4th, 1985, almost six years after Gary Dotson went to prison. A hush fell over the packed courtroom as Kathy Webb took the stand and began to express the guilt she had suffered since the night she made her false accusation. She claimed that at the time of the alleged rape, she was a scared 16-year-old. On and off during that year, she had been having unprotected sex with a boy her age. After one sexual encounter in early July, Kathy had become convinced that she was pregnant. She was afraid to talk to anyone about it. On the evening of July 9th, throughout her shift at Long John Silver's restaurant, she had begun to think of ways to shrug off her responsibility for the pregnancy. After leaving work at 8.30 that night, she claimed that she had wandered aimlessly for almost two hours. During her walk home, she said, she began to formulate a lie. Kathy would tell her foster mother that she was raped. She knew that the family she was with would cause her trouble if she was pregnant. And she believed that if she cried rape and she was raped, they would have sympathy for her. They couldn't blame her for the pregnancy. She retreated to this park to work out her plan. She tore her things and messed herself up. And she'd taken a piece of glass and, and scratched some letters on herself to make it look like she was kind of tormented in a rape. Suddenly, a light had shone on her, and she had tried to hide behind the bush. It was the police. The rape story that she planned on relating only to her foster mother was blurted out to the patrolman, and later to Officer Carroll at the Homewood Police Station. Her story finished. The question was, had she lied at the original trial, or was she lying now? On cross-examination, Assistant DA Margaret Frassard found gaping holes in Kathy's new story. You have facts here, physical facts, that simply have never been explained away in any reasonable fashion. Frassard wanted to know how, in addition to the scratches on her stomach, Kathy had gotten bruises in the interior of her vagina. The doctor who had examined her at the emergency room back in July of 1977 found that the interior vaginal injuries were consistent with forced uh, sexual contact and that they were recent. The doctor had also found a golf ball sized lump on Kathy's head. At the time, she had told police that her head had slammed into the car door frame when she was pulled inside. On both of these points, Kathy had no clear answers. She never gave any other explanation for that. So you had a series of these types of physical uh, pieces of evidence that simply was, were very consistent with rape and completely inconsistent with the notion of a fabricated uh, story. She was not particularly willing to answer questions in the format in which I wanted them answered. She wanted to do it her way. Her way meant she refused to elaborate on elements of her new story and she said she could not remember many important details. She presented herself as being honest, forthcoming, a person 
who was motivated by this religious conviction, you would expect her to be very open and straightforward in terms of her answers. Uh, that was not the case. When questioned about the semen stain found in her underpants on the night of July 9th, Kathy insisted that it was not the result of rape, but must have been from sex with her boyfriend. The problem with that, of course, is uh, we had information that suggested she had contact with the boyfriend the weekend before, around July 2nd, and the day of the rape was July 9th. So that would suggest that she wore the same underwear for perhaps seven days. We also had information that she had absolutely impeccable hygiene. The judge ended the hearings for the day and ordered that Gary, Kathy, and her former boyfriend all be tested to try and resolve the question of whose semen was left on the underpants. In the meantime, the judge allowed Dotson to post bond. Bail was set at $100,000. That night, an anonymous woman donated the 10% needed to release him. And for the first time in six years, Gary Dotson slept at his mother's house. DNA testing was still a new science in 1985. No test existed that was admitted in any courtroom. The semen test was still a simple comparison of blood types. It failed to exclude Dotson as the culprit, so testimony began again the following week. Three of Gary's friends were now called as alibi witnesses. Once the alibi witnesses started hitting the stand, it became clear that they were confused or lying. One claimed that Gary was never out of his sight for more than five minutes on the night of the rape. He, Gary, and several others had been out at parties until early the following morning. But Gary's story contradicted his friends. Dotson remembered attending the parties, but claimed that he fell asleep alone in the back of a car for some two hours. The judge had heard enough. He ruled that there was not sufficient evidence to corroborate Kathy's recantation. Gary was ordered back to prison. He slammed his fist down on the defense table before being handcuffed and led away. Kathy was mobbed by reporters outside the courthouse. I've lied in 1979, and I'm telling the truth now. Come on, watch your steps. I'm convinced, as I have been from the beginning, that this is an innocent man. Yeah. I feel that I failed him, and I feel that the system failed him. Tucked away from the crowd of Dotson's outraged supporters, prosecutors quietly celebrated. As they saw it, the system had done its job. Before we ever walked into the courtroom, minds were already made up that Gary Dotson was innocent and that Webb's story was believable. It unraveled once it was subject to the, the process of cross-examination. Kathy, however, was not defeated. She believed her faith had given her the strength to come forward. She would keep fighting until Gary Dotson was free. After the hearing failed to establish that Kathy Crowell Webb's recantation was the true story, there was only one person to whom she and Gary Dotson could appeal, the governor of Illinois. Governors share with the president of the United States a unique power in American justice to grant clemency. Gary Dotson returned to prison at the end of April 1985 after a brief taste of freedom. His conviction for rape had been upheld. Kathy Crowell Webb's recantation, which had seemed so sincere, had been tested in court and rejected. The Chicago DA's office found itself answering to a nationwide audience of Dotson's supporters, all demanding to know why an innocent man still languished behind bars. Kathy fueled the public's outrage by loudly sticking to her story. I want to see that man out. He's innocent. She also took a lie detector test and passed. The judge who had sent Gary back to prison was put under 24-hour surveillance when among the damning letters he received were threats on his life. Although public opinion was overwhelmingly in favor of freeing Dotson, his legal options were running out. I'm getting afraid to be hopeful. Why is that here? Uh, I'm just running through a, a revolving door, it seems. Dotson's last hope was to file a petition for mercy with the governor of Illinois, Jim Thompson. The clemency hearing is probably the most ancient power that governors possess, and it is the most basic, unreviewable power that any governor has. In a state with over 18,000 inmates, Governor Thompson reviewed hundreds of pardon requests a year, but Gary Dotson 
was not a normal inmate. Kathy Crowell Webb had made sure of that. They were running a kind of publicity campaign, constantly giving their side of it. So the public was only hearing this incredibly moving sob story of a man wrongfully accused and this woman having the courage to come forward. So there was outrage, there was anger and disbelief. Help my son because he didn't do it, he just didn't do it. In the face of this national attention, Governor Thompson named the Dotson case a top priority. Well, I wouldn't grant clemency unless I was convinced that uh, he was wrongfully convicted. The governor began by demanding that Dotson submit to a lie detector test, just as Kathy had done. Dotson's defense worried that the test was a lose-lose situation. Lie detectors are notoriously unreliable. Rarely are they used to solely determine an individual's guilt or innocence. If Gary passed, machine error could be cited. If he failed, his chances for freedom could be destroyed. It was a chance Dotson had to take. On May 6th, Gary took the test. Of course, he passed it with flying colors. After he passed it, they wanted him to take a second one. Dotson and his lawyer refused. The governor had little choice but to proceed. Dotson's clemency hearing began three days later, on May 9th, 1985. To accommodate public interest in this high-profile case, Governor Thompson decided to hold it in the state of Illinois center in downtown Chicago. The 600-seat auditorium was packed. This was Gary's last chance. Even if he couldn't clear his name, he might still gain his freedom. He read a prepared statement calling his plight a nightmare that doesn't seem to end. Nobody was willing to listen. Being sent to jail for rape destroyed not only my name, but the name of my five sisters, my brother, and my mother. The governor then called on Kathy to tell her story. As she had the previous month, Kathy recounted the sex with her boyfriend, her fear that she was pregnant, her elaborate lie, and her religious conversion. I had to grow um, in the Lord in faith and trust of him. So it took about three and a half years for your faith to overcome your fears? Yes, it did. And your fears were what? That I would go to jail. Asking you questions, I have no intent to try and trap you, and that if I ask you questions about previous statements, it's because inconsistencies bother me. Governor Thompson started with Kathy's assertion that the scratches found on her stomach were self-inflicted. Her memory on this issue, as it had been a month before, was foggy. I could even, even uh, you know, hit myself with a beer bottle. I don't remember. Did you find a beer bottle? I, I think that's what I used. You think that's what you used? I think that's what I used. In any event, you never drew letters on your abdomen, did you? It, it was not my intention to draw letters on my abdomen. If that's the way they came out, then if they came out looking something like letters, then that's possible. That sketch looks pretty clearly like letters, does it not? Yes, it does. The governor also found it strange that back in 1977, after Kathy had identified Dotson's mugshot, she had tentatively identified Gary's best friend in a lineup, saying that he could have been the man in the front passenger seat. She picks out of this lineup and out of all these thousands of photographs, not only Gary Dotson, but Gary Dotson's best friend of all the people in the world to pick out. But Kathy claimed that when she identified Gary's mugshot, it was from a stack of only four or five, and that police included his friend Mickey's picture in that stack as well. I recognized who turns out to be Mickey Markham in the lineup from the pictures that I had seen at my house. I recognized that he was one of the pictures. But you didn't feel under any pressure to identify the second man, even though the picture coincided with your description? No, because it only, I felt at the time it only took, takes one to rape. Many of the spectators were surprised at Kathy's demeanor. Gone was the courageous, emotional woman they had seen on national television. She was halting, defensive, vague, and she just kind of drew in. She'd make a statement and she expected that to be accepted, and then she'd just tighten right up and give a short little answer like that. Governor Thompson tried to artfully cross-examine her, but her answers to his 
questions were just as artful and just as sincere and truthful and well done. The governor ended the day by questioning Kathy about the 11 by 3 inch semen stain found in her underpants on the night of the rape. On this issue, Kathy's story had changed since the recantation hearing the month before. She had originally claimed that the stain was left in her underwear from having sex with her boyfriend a week earlier. Now she offered a new explanation, that the physical strain from working at Long John Silver's restaurant caused her to discharge the semen that night. You think that big stain came from the exertion of working on July 9th? It's possible. I mean, once again, even that explanation is totally incredible. Nationwide interest was intense. TV soap operas were interrupted to air the proceedings. It takes a lot to cancel the soaps. Uh, I was surprised by that. When the hearing resumed the following day, Kathy's foster parents were called to testify. Their relationship with Kathy had soured since she had recanted. They didn't believe her new story and were distressed by her testimony the previous day, describing their relationship with her as distant and mistrustful. Up until three weeks ago, we were mom and dad. She was a little doll and we loved her very much. She was the daughter I never had. The foster parents claim that on the night of the alleged rape, Kathy was hysterical. She didn't seem to be lying. She held on to me real tight and started sobbing. The Smiths also disputed Kathy's supposed motive for falsely crying rape. Even before she identified Dotson, said the foster mother, Kathy knew she wasn't pregnant. I can't fight anything Kathy says. I don't want to make a liar out of her any more than she's made a liar out of herself. Kathy claimed that her lies snowballed, and as the case took on a life of its own, she was scared of the repercussions that telling the truth would bring. She had gone to a point of no return where then she would have to admit that she lied, uh, that she was a liar, that she caused all of uh, these problems for the police, for her family. Despite the testimony against Kathy, there was no doubt who the vast majority of spectators were supporting when Gary's attorney made an impassioned too plea to Governor Thompson. It's just too outrageous. Find me a motive. Don't suggest to me that she's a religious nut or don't suggest to me that she's mentally unstable, or don't make all these other suggestions to me. Show me. He has the right to a pardon based upon innocence. I urge you to give it to him. Thank you. In making his decision, Governor Thompson faced both legal and political responsibilities. He was up for re-election in 1985, and the public clearly wanted to see Dotson released. Yet the governor, a former prosecutor, seemed far from convinced that Dotson was really innocent. So Thompson did what all savvy politicians do. He came up with a solution to satisfy both the law and the public. Gary Dotson's clemency hearing was his last chance at freedom. Illinois Governor Jim Thompson was the only person standing between him and the remainder of his 25 to 50 year sentence for raping Kathy Crowell Webb, a rape Kathy insisted had never happened. The governor called a press conference on May 12, 1985, the day after the hearing concluded, to announce his decision. Dotson, like thousands of others, watched the governor on TV at home with his mother and friends. I believe that Kathy Crowell Webb was raped on the evening of July 9, 1977. I do not believe the recantation story of Kathy Crowell Webb. I am satisfied also that Gary Dotson was proved guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I said because his victim was now telling me that she did not want him to serve any more time in the penitentiary and because he had already served a sentence that was as long or longer than the average sentence served by a rapist in Illinois, I granted the petition to the extent that it cut his sentence to time served. Gary Dotson was now a free man. But he had not been exonerated. The result failed to answer the obvious, uncomfortable question. Why would she come forward now, six years later, with this preposterous 
lie about having made up a lie six years before. There was no purpose. She stood to gain in no way. She was bearing heavy cost uh, because of the embarrassment, revealing facts that uh, she did not want to reveal to her husband and to her family and to her extended family. It has cost her a great deal. It's cost her time. It's cost her shame, embarrassment. It's cost her a, a scarlet letter, if you will, in her community. Still, Kathy's story did not seem to add up. Many of her physical injuries were never explained, and her emotional state in the weeks after the alleged incident seemed consistent with someone who really had been raped. Every person I spoke with who had seen Kathy Crowell Webb that night or in the days and weeks that followed, from police investigators to doctors to family members to friends, every one of them believed she had been raped. The foster mother said she was shaking, she was uncontrollable, it lasted forever, she had to spend weeks, if not months, coaxing her back into living. Experts on rape suggested that if Kathy had been assaulted, she may have repressed the terrifying experience and convinced herself that it never happened. She did not receive any special type of um, Oh, therapy or treatment uh, that nowadays many rape, vi rape victims had the benefit of. Uh, as a result, she was not able to work through sort of the guilt that surrounds this type of life experience. And perhaps it was working through this guilt that brought her to a state of denial. Others suggested she may have felt responsible for what happened to her. Did she start to personalize it, to say, what did I do to cause this rape? It's a very short jump from that to, I wasn't raped, it was consensual, and I've got a guy in prison for years and years, and it really wasn't his fault, it was my fault. And she could very well believe that. Despite the persistent second guessing, Kathy's story never wavered, and after a spate of media appearances with Gary Dotson, she slipped back into the anonymity of her former life. Dotson, while maintaining his innocence, said he was satisfied with the governor's decision. All along, we knew, we knew he, he, he'd come through with this because they can't, more or less they can't say that uh, I'm innocent because it'd make the system look so bad. Dotson had no real legal avenue to try and clear his name until a new procedure provided him one final chance. By 1987, DNA testing had reached a higher level of sophistication. The courts were beginning to make use of DNA analysis. Dotson's new lawyer, Tom Breen, said the test would once and for all establish the truth. It would answer the question about whether or not Kathy Crowell Webb did in fact have sex with her boyfriend as she testified at the pardon hearing, or if Gary Dotson raped her as she had originally said years back that resulted in the conviction. Breen cautioned Dotson on the potential disaster that the test could bring. Gary, this is it. The game is over. If you don't pass this test, it's over for you. You are going to go back to the penitentiary, back to maximum security, and you may die there. Dotson jumped. It was the most lively I had seen him in the months that I knew him and he said I want the test the results came back in Dotson's favor the report indicated absolutely without question without any doubt at all that the semen found in Kathy Crow Webb after she had alleged a rape had taken place was in fact not Gary Dotson's, but that the sperm was consistent with Kathy Crow Webb's boyfriend. In August 1989, a judge finally said the words Gary Dotson had waited 12 years to hear. His rape conviction was thrown out on the basis of the DNA analysis, and he was granted a new trial. As expected, 
prosecutors dismissed the charges against him. Twelve long, grueling years, I guess I could say, um, and I'm relieved it's over. The case was finally closed. Dotson was vindicated. He was, beyond a reasonable doubt, innocent. The question of whether he received justice was another matter. You can't claim that's, that an innocent man who spends six years in hell uh, can ever receive justice. He's never been financially compensated. He's never even been given an apology. So the fact that the state said that we're not going to try you anymore is not my definition of justice. DNA evidence may finally have exonerated Gary Dotson, but the questions remain. What did happen to Kathy Crowell on the night of July 9, 1977? Her recantation rang false to so many because it failed to explain her physical injuries, the semen evidence, or her apparent emotional distress following the alleged rape. After his release from prison, Dotson found it hard to handle his notoriety. He got in a number of fights and was twice returned to jail for parole violations. The same DNA test that cleared Dotson's name in 1988 seemed to suggest that Kathy's former boyfriend might, after all, have been the one who had sex with her. So was she protecting him for some reason by accusing Gary? Could he have been the perpetrator? The chances are we'll never know. The statute of limitations on the alleged rape long ago expired. And in any case, the alleged victim still maintains there was no crime. Defenders of our justice system like to say that ultimately the truth will out. This case is one of the exceptions.